Hi, everyone. My name is Seth Adams. I'm the Land Conservation Director for Save Mount Diablo, and welcome to our Nature Heals and Inspires Zoom series. Normally, Ted Clement, our Executive Director, would welcome you, but he's a little under the weather today. For those of you who might be new to Save Mount Diablo, we're a nationally accredited nonprofit land trust formed in 1971 in the East Bay section of San Francisco Bay. We have a mission to protect the important open space lands associated with Mount Diablo and the mountain's connection to its sustained Diablo range to the south, to create lasting public benefits for communities and local flora and fauna. We use various tools like land acquisition, land use advocacy, education, and stewardship. To our supporters watching this presentation, thank you. Together with, with your wonderful support, Save Mount Diablo will continue to, to do great things to protect the ultimate foundation for our long-term health and well-being. Understanding that nature is the ultimate foundation we developed a free public education Zoom series entitled Nature Heals and Inspires to help our communities understand that nature is a critical part of the solution to working through these challenging times. Our Nature Heals and Inspires Zoom series started in April 2020, and to date we've delivered well over two dozen presentations by an amazing and diverse group of experts, ecotherapists, conservationists, scholars, artists, scientists, etc all exploring this topic of how nature helps it, uh, heal us and inspire us. Through this exploration, we've been getting important clues on how to better align ourselves and our culture with the natural world we are part of. As I said, I'm Seth Adams, Save Mount Diablo's Land Conservation Director. I was our first employee in 1988, and throughout my 34 years here, I repeatedly encouraged the organization to expand its geographic range further south into the Diablo Range. Joseph Belli on, on uh, the left here, on my screen at least, uh, with his uh, book, The Diablo Diary, uh, is a wildlife conservation biologist and a book author, and he fits in with our expanding focus on the rest of the Diablo range to the south. Joseph is gonna read parts of his book, The Diablo B Diary. He's gonna tell stories about his lifetime of experiences chasing wildlife in the Diablo range. And I'm, I'm gonna pose a few questions to him along the way, followed at the end by questions from the audience. Southeast of San Francisco lies the Diablo Range, familiar to many but little known. Though much has been written about the California landscape, the Diablo Range has largely been overlooked. Wildlife biologist Joseph Belli, a lifelong resident of the region, seeks to change that. In the Diablo Diary, he presents 25 natural history essays focusing on the creatures, controversies, and threats to this sizable tract of de facto wilderness on the edge of the Bay Area. Writings on mountain lions, California condors, and tule elk share space with pieces on California tiger salamanders, San Joaquin kit foxes, and horned lizards. Their stories address larger environmental issues, habitat loss, the threat posed by invasive species, the consequences of water development, and policy decisions both local and national, along with essays on animals or human stories, ruminations on isolation, mortality, and coping with change, as well as humorous writings. Written with the eye of a scientist, the zeal of an activist, and the soul of an artist, the Diablo Diary is a fascinating study of an often overlooked mountain range and its inhabitants. Joseph Belli has explored the Diablo Range since he was a kid when his family moved to its foothills. He earned a degree in conservation biology at San Jose State University and has worked for the National Park Service, surveying the land, animals, and plants in the area. He lives in Pacheco Pass near Henry Coe State Park, and he's working on his second book, about the California condor reintroduction program for which he is a volunteer. His resume includes things like walking a thousand miles in Henry Coe State Park over seven years to survey all the ponds for red-legged frogs and other amphibians, sampling watersheds for Western pond turtles, snipping the tails of spiny lizards for DNA sampling, thousands of hours tracking reintroduced California condors around pinnacles. His stories are about chasing tule elk and pronghorn, experiences with mountain lions, a friend of Byron is writing and suggested he collect his stories and essays, and they became the Diablo Diary. Joseph Belli eats, breathes, and sleeps, and sleeps the Diablo Range and its wildlife. And he and I, on a monthly basis, um, go uh, uh, exploring different parts of the Diablo Range, looking for rare and endangered wildlife. I am really pleased to present my friend, uh, 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 wildlife biologist and writer, Joseph Belli. Um, and he's going to tell you a little bit about growing up in the Diablo Range, how he became a wildlife biologist, and how he started to write. Thank you very much, Seth. Yeah, I grew up uh, 
east of San Jose in the foothills uh, on a wonderful property of uh, uh, six acres. For a kid, that's that's just kind of a playland. But, uh, uh, now, my family, we didn't uh, we didn't backpack or camp very much, um, but we did uh, have day trips. And some of the most memorable ones were in the area. We go to Allen Rock Park and check out Penitentia Creek and uh, Gilroy Hot Springs, um, where uh, you know I, I, you know, I fell in love with Coyote Creek there at the age of you know six or seven years old. I've been going there ever since. Um, my father, uh, he leased several cattle ranches around Mount Hamilton, and when I got old enough. Uh, to drive, uh, I would go up there all the time and uh, treat those places like a park. Uh, that's where I really cut my teeth uh, uh, learning about wildlife. Uh, I would consume books and field guides, and I, I was really obsessed with identifying things. Uh, so I would just be up there in the hills all the time. As I got older and I got to drive more. I would uh, head to uh, all the public lands that I could find in the area, uh, especially to the south. I hit BLM lands. I drive every road that I possibly could and uh, just kind of soak it all in. Uh, I had this uh, idea as I got older, I would hike more and more and I kept wanting to have a purpose to my hikes. You know, it became more than recreation to me. Uh, for example, I, I'd pick out a creature, uh, a, a whiptail lizard, uh, golden eagle, and uh, I would go out uh, hoping to find these these animals. Uh, I'd do stuff like drive at night for amphibians and reptiles, or, or I'd drive roads uh, looking for roadkill just to see what was in the area because I was so so very curious about uh, what was living in my backyard. Later on, uh, I had this idea of uh, wanting to volunteer and wanting to do something more with my time. So in the early 1990s, I started volunteering at Henry Coe State Park. And there I began doing this citizen science project, uh, basically these amphibian surveys for uh, endangered amphibians, mostly California red-legged frog, California tiger salamander. So I spent uh, six or seven years uh, with a dip net going into the ponds of Henry Coe State Park, and I expanded it to several other parks, uh, Pacheco State Park, uh, Joseph Grant County Park in Santa Clara County. And uh, through doing that, uh, I guess I developed some sort of a reputation and uh, I had the opportunity to attend San Jose State University and get a degree in conservation biology. And that was very important to me because, uh, you know, when I was college age, I didn't really, I was kind of ignorant about what was out there. I thought the only jobs in, in nature would be, uh, you know, park ranger or game warden. And those things are fine, but. I wanted to do something a little bit different and there just didn't seem to be uh, the field of conservation biology I think was just getting started in the 1980s, which is when I went to school or college the first time. So it, it was very rewarding to me to go back to college. And uh, I was very emphatic about getting a conservation degree because I wanted my activities uh, to uh, enhance the lands around me and the creatures, the species. Uh, conservation was very, very important to me the older I got. Uh, so one of the other things uh, that was important to me uh, ever since I was a boy, I'd go with my dad to these ranches and uh, I'd had this dream of living on these ranches and that wasn't very practical. I mean, some of the, you know, some of the buildings weren't up to code or, or it was just a long, long distance and just not practical. But I always, I never gave up on the dream of living in the mountains. Uh, well, in, in 2005, I found some property in uh, along Pacheco Pass and I moved there. And uh, so 
so that was kind of a culmination of, uh, I guess you would say, a lifelong dream. And one of the first things I did, it was 55 acres. So one of the first things I did was uh, get this project where I was cataloging all the species that I could find there. Uh, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, birds, trees, shrubs, and wildflowers. And I tried butterflies, but I'm not very good at butterflies. Uh, one of the other things I did uh, was, uh, strangely enough, I started writing. And uh, that was really strange because I'd never uh, written before. And honestly, I, I didn't, you know, I'd read a lot of nonfiction and nature uh, books and material, but I didn't read much literature. Uh, so I wasn't, you know, I was a very concentrated reader. Uh, but at the same time, I, I just had this overwhelming urge to write. And what I wanted to write were essays. I really liked uh, the works of like David Plomman, uh, Barbara Pinsolver. Uh, so that those were the authors I was reading at the time. And I thought, I'd kind of like to do this. And I'd like to talk about the animals and the issues that are in my neck of the woods. You know, people say when you write, to write what you know. Well, I don't really know too many things. But, you know, like they, they have that saying of that you spend 10,000 hours doing something, um, you develop some expertise. Well, I can tell you I've spent 10,000 hours, you know, hiking and exploring the Diablo range. So I don't know about the level of expertise, but uh, I've certainly put in a lot of hours. So I began writing and uh, I didn't really uh, plan on a book at first. I just wanted to, I just wrote up a list of uh, uh, species and topics that I wanted to talk about. And I went down, you know, one by one. And uh, the first list only had like eight or 10, and that's certainly not enough for a book. Um, but the more I wrote, the more uh, new, uh, new topics opened up for me. So uh, I ended up uh, getting about 18 or 20. I, I wrote these essays mostly between 2006 and 2008. When I had about 20 of them, I went to submit the book for publication. And I, I was very picky. I only wanted one outlet to publish the book. And if they didn't want it, I told myself I would self-publish it. Uh, and as it turned out, uh, they very gently and politely passed on the book. And uh, I thought to myself, you know, I was a little bit discouraged, but I also thought, well, this book could be better. And uh, I wanted to write uh, even more. So I, I added about five more essays, uh, which I wrote uh, between like 2008 and 2012 or so, or, or 13. And uh, the book was basically completed by then in 2013. But because I was going through, uh, I was going through school again, and I was working on my thesis. Uh, I did a master's thesis on uh, Western pond turtles. Um, I took the full seven years to do that. I think I might have set a record. Uh, but uh, I put the book on the back burner until the thesis was done. I didn't want to try to serve two masters like that. Uh, I'm not very good at multitasking. So once I got done uh, with my degree, I decided to self-publish the book. And uh, I'll admit, I didn't really know what I was doing or getting into. I just kind of put it out there on Amazon and... Uh, let it be and, and uh, just uh, see where it would go. And here we are four years later. And to me, this is this has exceeded, you know, my wildest expectations. I'd always hope that. Uh, so I'm going to break in here for just a second and let people know that in part because so little has been written about the Diablo range as an entire geographic feature, um, the Diablo diary is the very best piece of writing that exists about the Diablo range. Um, and sh you should really take uh, the opportunity to buy it on Amazon and check it out. Um, uh, Joseph is going to do four or five readings from the book. Uh, some of them he's adapted a little bit. And I think the first one uh, is about grizzly bears, um, or the California grizzly. And uh, so uh, um, let's get going with that, um, Joseph. And uh, I'll come in with a question at the end of that. Okay.
So in writing about a sense of place, you often find yourself telling stories about loss. My story of loss involved the California grizzly. And this, uh, so this essay is entitled, Once There Were Bears. Once there were bears here in California. Yes, the state harbors a healthy population of black bears, but those are not the bears of which I speak. The bear to which I'm referring is the grizzly bear, Ursus arctus, icon of the Western wilderness and the preeminent animal in North America. Once there were bears, here in the Diablo range, there are at least 18 different geographical features named after grizzlies, far more than with any other creature. The great bear is everywhere, yet it is nowhere. And that is more than a shame, it's a tragedy. Once there were bears, not confined to the fastness of the high Sierra, grizzlies roamed throughout the state, thriving everywhere but the deserts. At the dawn of the gold rush, California was teeming with grizzlies, sporting the densest population on earth. 10,000 may have roamed California. To put that in perspective, the entire grizzly population south of Canada is estimated at just over 1,000. Once there were bears, <laughs> if I was asked what ails the California landscape using just one sentence, those four words would be my response. When California lost the grizzly, the Golden State faded to pyrite in a matter of decades. A 100,000 year tenure on the land produced a creature more uniquely Californian than any artifact of our brief culture. When the grizzly vanished, California lost its wild heart. The creature adorning the state flag was exterminated. When you kill off your symbols, something is amiss. Get an idea of just how far we've fallen from grace. Consider this. Some ecologists assert that feral hogs, swine for God's sakes, have assumed the role once held by the mighty grizzly in our ecosystems. These creatures of a lesser god took hold around the time the grizzly disappeared and are about as awe-inspiring as a prize in a Cracker Jack box. Gazing south from my balcony, the scene before me looks much as, as it must have a thousand years ago. Mountain lions still prowl the canyons, elk graze the ridges, and the occasional condor so, soars over skies at last braced over a century ago. It's as if the mountains themselves are reawakening after a long, dreary slumber. Yet all is not well, for whichever remote, dusty trail I walk, I see no tracks larger than my own. The magnificent beast whose name still haunts the land remains achingly absent. And California, once the kingdom of the grizzly, seems empty. Once there were bears, now there are none. That's great. That's great. And uh, we were we were on a walk today. Uh, our, our walk this month was actually me showing Joseph around rather than the opposite. And uh, we were in Pine Canyon looking at the peregrine falcons there um, and talking about grizzly bears. So I have a sense of where Joseph's going to go with this. But how does the California grizzly story make you feel? Um, and uh, um, Local extinction, extinction is forever, but local extinction may not be quite be quite quite be so. Will we ever get grizzlies back in California? I would say that ecologically it's possible. I have a hard time ever seeing it happen socio-politically. I mean, we haven't been able to reintroduce them uh, to the wilderness of Idaho, nor have we yet reintroduced them or augmented the population in the North Cascades, uh, right next to current populations. Uh, if it's that difficult to get them back there, where they should be uh, next, um, it's really, really hard for me to see them coming back, although that's always been a dream of mine. It probably, if it ever happens, I don't think I'll live to see it. Great. Um, thank you, Joseph. And so uh, um, the second reading, uh, uh, is about Native Americans, uh, one in particular. So take it away. Well, there's a sequence to the essays in this book, and I kind of think of it like tracks on an album. Uh, the first few are serve as introductory pieces, 
the bulk of the book, the middle section deals with essays on species and issues. And towards the end, it's less about nature and more about human nature, more like, more, truly more like essays. So I talk about subjects, the cheery topics such as, you know, mortality, isolation, change. This is one about loneliness, and it's about each, and it's called The Man Who Walked Off the Edge of the Earth. Early in the morning of August 29, 1911, a man perhaps 50 years of age sat huddled in the corral of a slaughterhouse just outside Oroville. Several days earlier, for reasons known only to him, he had abruptly left the only land he'd ever known and wandered into the lowlands 40 miles south. He was discovered by men working nearby. Clad only in a makeshift poncho, he neither spoke nor understood a word of English. They took him to be some sort of wild man and called the sheriff. Newspaper coverage spread quickly and caught the eyes of two anthropology professors from UC Berkeley, Alfred Kroger and Thomas Waterman. Waterman suspected the man might be Yahi, a Native American tribe that had presumably vanished decades earlier. Professor Kroger arranged to have the man, who he dubbed Ishii, transferred to his custody. Ishii's time in that new world was all too brief. He contracted tuberculosis in 1915 and died in the spring of 1916, not five years after wandering down from his ancestral homeland. Details of Ishii's life are wonderfully chronicled in Theodora Kroger's book, Ishii in Two Worlds, especially the poignancy of his existence. Ishii was born into a small group that diminished until he was the only one left. The conflict began during the gold rush. The Yahi did not understand the concept of livestock as property. In their view, all animals were wild. They raided the settlers' herds for food and violence between the two groups erupted and escalated. It was into this hostile environment that Ishii was born. By 1872, the Yahi were down to about 15 individuals who adopted a lifestyle that enabled them to disappear without a trace. They stopped raiding, they lived in camouflaged huts, and when walking, they covered their tracks, they kept fires small, and destroyed the remains immediately after. In 1894, they were down to five. Ishii, his mother, sister, uncle, and another young man of no relation. When that man died, there were just four. They managed to live undetected until 1908. In November 1908, surveyors from the Oro Light and Power Company stumbled onto the village. Ishii was not present. His sister and uncle took flight, never to be seen again. Ishii's mother lay on the ground, covered in hides, helpless and immobile. The men returned, to, returned the next day, only to find the woman gone, the village deserted. It is left to Ishii to reveal their fates. Of his sister and uncle, he was convinced they both died trying to escape. His mother died shortly after as well. With her passing, Ishii entered the era of solitude. From November 1908 until his sojourn to the corral outside of Oroville, he was completely alone in a way none of us will ever face. He was not merely the last of his family, he was the last of his tribe, culture, and language. If you could sit down and talk with one figure from history, who would it be? I'd choose Ishii. And I'd like to ask two questions that only he could answer. The first is how. How did he make it day after day, night after night, for nearly three years? What toll does loneliness extract from a psyche and soul? What happens to the human spirit when the future offers nothing but more isolation? What must it be like to never hear your language again or to never speak to anyone ever more? As much as I'd like to hear his answers, I'm not sure I'd be comfortable asking such pointed questions. Theodora Kroeber wrote that speaking of past tragedies left Ishii depressed. Perhaps some insights are not worth pursuing. The second question is why? Why, after having endured almost three years of complete isolation, did Ishii so uncharacteristically walk away from the only life and land he'd ever known 
and risk death traveling to the lowlands. If he ever confided that to anyone, I'm unaware of it. Some say he did it because he was starving. And a photo of him taken on the day of his capture shows a gaunt, emaciated man. Others suggest he was despondent. That he undertook his perilous quest because he no longer cared whether or not he lived or died. That same photo reveals a man with hair singed short, a customary practice for one in mourning. So, hunger and despair, both plausible reasons. But I hold my own belief about why Ishii suddenly walked away from his world. Theodora Krober noted that Ishii preferred companionship over solitude. He made friends easily. He loved the joke and talk despite the language barrier. Representatives from the Bureau of Indian Affairs reminded Ishii that he was not obligated to stay with the professors. He could have moved to a reservation or returned to his ancestral home where he need not live like a fugitive any longer. Yet he emphatically chose to stay. Finally, Theodore Krober offers this nugget of insight into Ishii's personality, quote, for whatever personal or custom ingrained reasons, they're attached to parting a significance best not accorded recognition in words. So Ishii, it seems, had trouble saying goodbye. Maybe he wandered down out of hunger. Perhaps he did so because he lost a little to live. I'm not buying either of those. I think Ishii was just lonely. Well, that issue story clearly resonates with you, um, and I know a little bit about your own personality, so why does the story resonate with you? Living by yourself in Pacheco Pass um, in the wilderness, uh, uh, what's the connection? Yeah, no, I, I could really, uh, you know, I could really uh, relate to Ishii in some ways. Uh, now, my situation is, is much, much different, but, you know, just to give you an idea, the closest person to me lives a half mile away. And so basically I have no neighbors and uh, I have a very small social group, I always have. Um, and I, I really like solitude a lot, but there's a fine, fine line between solitude and loneliness. And uh, there are times maybe when I start feeling that way, uh, but whenever I do, I kind of think about Ishii and I think, boy, if you think, uh, that you're isolated. Uh, just that you can't even imagine what he went through. And it's been kind of interesting lately. I've been uh, reading up on uh, some of the effects of the pandemic and how much isolation and loneliness has been kind of a side effect of uh, the response to COVID. And uh, I've just read a lot of articles about that and been kind of fascinated by it. So I think Ishii kind of still, his story kind of still resonates with us. Uh, I, I've, I've always found it very, very powerful. Well, um, not all the stories in the Diablo range um, are quite so somber as an extinct grizzly bear or um, the last of a, a race of, of Indians. Um, uh, you're gonna tell us about uh, another uh, story, a success story, um, and then we'll talk a little bit after that. Yeah. Yes, this is, uh, just as there are stories of loss, there are also stories of hope. This is about the improbable return of the Tulio, and it's called uh, the Song of the Phoenix. San Antonio Valley lies halfway across the Diablo Range in the northern section between San Jose and the Central Valley. As valleys go, it's not much. It's seven miles long and a mile or two wide. The valley yields impressive wildflower displays in spring, and blue oaks line its bucolic two-lane two -lane road. It resembles gold country, but if you were to drive the road at sunset in late summer, you might be fortunate enough to behold a scene that no longer plays itself out in the Sierra foothills, a herd of tule elk on the eve of the rut. At the dawn of the mission era, vast herds of tule elk roamed the foothills and valleys of the state. Endemic to California, this subspecies grazed in profusion throughout the Central Valley and along the coast. The gold rush had a devastating impact on it. Market hunting spelled doom for the once fast herds. 
agricultural development removed vital habitat, and by the dawn of the 20th century, tule elk were probably fewer in number in California than wolves, grizzlies, or condors. The last band of tule elk was concentrated in the southwest corner of the San Joaquin Valley on lands comprising part of Henry Miller's ranching empire. Henry Miller was an immigrant from, Jim, from Germany who came to the United States with scarcely a dollar to his name. After settling in San Francisco, he opened a profitable butcher shop and parlayed that success into the largest ranching enterprise this country has ever seen. So when it came to his attention that the last band of Tulio was roaming his land and occasionally raiding his alfalfa fields, Miller responded in remarkable fashion. He gave the herd to the federal government. In 1904, that last band of elk was rounded up and relocated. For decades, Tule elk remained in limbo. In 1970, 66 years after the initial roundup, there were only 500. In the Diablo Range, elk were returned to the hills east of San Jose in 1978. I remember seeing a lone bull alongside Mount Hamilton Road. 22 years would pass before I saw another. In the autumn of 2000, elk were spotted on the ranch leased by my father east of Mount Hamilton. Several November hikes yielded tracks and droppings, but no sightings. As December approached, I zeroed in on Blumbago Canyon and an old Jeep trail that bears the foreboding moniker of Graveyard Road. It was while descending Graveyard Road that I noticed a bull elk reclining in a hillside meadow 200 feet away. I got down on all fours and proceeded. The first 50 feet of the stock were easy, for oak trees were plentiful. However, where the oaks ended and the meadow began, things got challenging. 50 yards of open ground stood between me and that bull. The sole source of cover in that distance was a fallen tree whose trunk provided a two-foot-tall barricade. If I could make it there undetected, I might be able to take an outstanding picture. I had to be especially careful. I moved only when there was background noise, a plane passing over, or the raucous screeching of, of scrub jays. It took 45 minutes to get to that fallen oak. I was acutely aware I had already come closer to a large wild animal than a person should. I started snapping pictures. With the first click of a camera, the bull rose and faced, faced me. He stood motionless for an uncomfortably long time before trotting off. As I watched him, I marveled at how such a large and stately animal could roam free across the landscape, unencumbered by brand or bridle, property of no one, honoring neither fence nor corral. I took great solace in knowing that these mountains were still wild enough to allow such magnificent animals to exist here. It is the onset of a mild August evening. The waxing moon rises, and the two-lane two road is blessedly deserted. The faint stirring of a breeze caresses your ears as it passes through a gray pot, sounding almost liquid. A pair of morning doves whistles past, while a handful of magpies chatter as they cross the valley en route to their evening roost. Then, in the distance, you hear it, a brief, measured wail, rising in pitch, the bugle of a tulio. It is melancholy, eerie and hauntingly beautiful. It is the song of the phoenix rising timelessly in the late summer twilight. So you've watched the Tule Elks uh, 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 reintroduction and restoration since you were a boy and we were out a month ago um, chasing Tule Elk on the backside of Mount Hamilton and the month before that I'm seeing them in, in several places in the Southern Diablo range. How has it been to watch that program succeed? And how are they doing now? It's been really uh, fascinating to watch them, to watch it succeed. Uh, I, it's really hard to assess how well they're doing. Personally, I think they are doing quite well. Um, I am not privy to all the information about all the sites that they've been reintroduced to, but I know that they have them you know, in San Antonio Valley behind Mount Hamilton, they have a, a herd, uh, might have been part of the same herd at one time, along Coyote Ridge in San Jose. 
I believe there are some around Livermore. Uh, there are quite a few in the southern San Benito County, both around Hernandez Reservoir uh, and uh, Upper Peachtree Valley. So uh, I hesitate. Oh, and also uh, San Luis Reservoir. I occasionally have elk come onto my property, and it's always just uh, a red letter day when uh, I can look out my window and, and see a tulio. That that just blows me away. So, so I'd like to think that they are doing well, uh, uh, or at least you know they'll never be back to what they were before. But uh, I do believe that there's a place for them on the California landscape, and they are just uh, fascinating creatures to watch. It, of course, they're related to deer, but very, very different in behavior. And uh, someone's asked about the controversy of, about tule elk at Point Reyes and um, some of these things that we're gonna, we're gonna answer by email to the, to the group, some of the questions that we'll, we will take up. Um, but one of the stories I really wanna get to um, is Joseph's involvement with the Pentacles Condor, California Condor Reintroduction Program. Um, and I know that your second book is about the Condor Program. So, um, uh, take it away on California condors. Yeah, do you want me to read, uh, talk about the book first or? Uh, well, e either either direction, but why don't you do the reading? Why don't you do the reading and then talk okay. about the book? Okay, so when I was a boy, I was, the California condor was like a mythical creature. Uh, to me, uh, they were, uh, I don't know, like dragons. Uh, um, I've been spellbound by condors since I was like six or seven years old. And uh, things were looking really bad. I mean, depending on how old you are, if you remember the 1970s and early 1980s, uh, despite all the protection, the numbers were going down, down, down. And uh, people didn't really know why. Uh, eventually they were all, they, they got down to, you know, maybe 22 individuals. And uh, those birds were taken into captivity over a period of several years. And the species was really saved through a captive breeding program. That captive breeding program started <coughs> reaching condors into the wild uh, in the early 1990s, starting in Southern California, where they were last, uh, where they last inhabited. And then uh, also the Grand Canyon. And, uh, they brought them back to Central California. I think it was in 1996, first in Big Sur by the Ventana Wildlife Society. And uh, then in 2003, the Pinnacles. So they came back to the Diablo range, basically. And that was something that I thought uh, I would never see. Uh, I remember going to that very first uh, release there. And it was kind of anticlimactic. Uh, the weather was horrible. The birds wouldn't leave the release pen. Uh, they eventually got released uh, later on, and uh, a flock started up. And uh, after a couple of years, the birds from Pinnacles and the birds from Big Sur uh, pretty much merged into being one flock. In 2010, uh, I became a volunteer with the Condor Project at uh, the Pinnacles National Park, and I've been uh, monitoring condors ever since. Uh, one to two days a week uh, since 2010. In fact, I was just doing that the other day. So anyway, this is uh, uh, this essay I, I wrote in 2007 before my uh, my volunteer involvement. Uh, so in some ways, it, it's kind of dated, but uh, I still kind of like it. And one thing we're going to add here is don't go away because at the end of this essay, we're going to tell you something that some of you will find extraordinary. So amazing and. Uh, California condors. Okay. This essay is called The Harder They Fall. January 17th, 2004. I've spent the last three weekends trying to observe condors in Pinnacles National Monument. A half dozen were released here in December, the first in a series of releases aiming to restore the great bird to a region it hasn't occupied for over a century. I'm headed for a vantage point above Shalone Creek on the slopes of Mount Defiance. Coming upon a level spot, I settle in for a day of condor watching. 3.15 p.m. There's an hour and a half of sunlight left. 
and soon the birds will be looking to roost for the evening. I'm ready to pack it in myself. I let my vision drift to the north, where I spy a large black shape flying low over Shalona Creek, a quarter mile distant. One of the condors has decided to head west before settling in for the night. As the condor approaches, it veers off over a tight, steep ravine, only to resume in my direction. The great bird wheels in the air right in front of me, not 30 feet off the ground, looks at me, and with an incredibly loud flap of its wings, returns back up the canyon, seconds later, completely out of sight. If I live to be 100, I will never forget the day the largest bird on the continent flew within a stone's throw of me. Standing alone on that slope, I experienced a condor much as people did a thousand years ago, when the world was big and wonderfully wild. Nearly everything you've read about the California condor references its historic past, usually by proclaiming the species an Ice Age remnant or Pleistocene relic. While this is technically true, it's misleading. For in evolutionary terms, the Pleistocene was just moments ago. So yes, the condor is an Ice Age holdover, but so are crows and raccoons. Some use the Ice Age relic argument against the condor, claiming the species is old, outdated, and convalescent. That's bullshit. It is an old age that hobbles the condor. It's large size. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. While size has benefits, it brings with it burdens, making large animals more vulnerable to extinction. Large creatures exist in smaller numbers, require larger tracts of habitat, and have lower reproductive rates. 10,000 years ago, our planet harbored a vast assemblage of immense, wondrous beasts. And North America boasted the most amazing collection of all. Mammoths, mastodons, giant ground sloths, short-faced bears, saber-toothed cats. The skies were patrolled by incredible territories, birds with an 18-foot wingspan. Today, only the California condor remains. The rest are gone, regrettably and irretrievably lost, leaving behind tantalizing remains in the pack ice of the Arctic or the sticky dew of the La Brea tar pits. The wild world is shrinking with each passing year. We are hurtling toward a dismal, lonely future where large wild animals no longer exist. Can you imagine a world without elephants? whales or tigers? Large animals are worth preserving, not merely for the ecological niches they fill, but the enormous role they play in human culture. Large beasts have figured prominently in our stories, cultures, and religions since prehistoric times. One might argue that today's technological world has little use for such bygone remnants, but that simply isn't so. We are spellbound by large beasts because their size kindles the imagination. They make the world seem bigger, wilder, and more mysterious. As they become rare, we value them more. You might even say we miss them. Evidence of this lies in the realm of cryptozoology, which concentrates on creatures rumored to exist. A cursory glance at the cryptozoological lineup reveals a pantheon of fantastic beasts, all large. The Loch Ness Monster, the Dinosaur of the Congo, the Yeti and Sasquatch. Me, I don't think any of those crypto creatures exist. I think they're manifestations of what we've lost, a way of replacing a part of our world that has been diminished, a world of mystery, wildness, and large wondrous beasts. Conventional wisdom admonishes us that we couldn't possibly live with them, but we're not doing very well at all without them. As those glorious large animals pass from the earth, something deep in our soul dies. The bigger they are, the harder they fall, and the harder they fall, the farther we fall. So um, on one of our recent drives, we were talking about condors and I was asking you to describe them since there's often this 
this idea of them as a sedentary aging species that's on its way out. Um, and so I asked you to tell us about condors as species, as a species. What are their personalities like as a species? What are their personalities like as an individual? And you you came up with one word, which I'm going to let you uh, give people that that I turned my head around in terms of thinking about condors. So um, tell us about their personalities. Well, I started out by saying that uh, they were badass. Uh, to me, they've got this. Uh, they're so fascinating because they have uh, this nonchalance about them towards people. I mean, try to observe another large bird. Try to get anywhere near an eagle or, or a hawk or a vulture. They, they just get the hell out of there. When, uh, they want nothing to do with people. And it's not that condors uh, really want to do much with people, but they're very, very curious. And they have this... Uh, attitude about them that they're going to go where they want to go and if you happen to be there uh, they're going to basically go right next to you and i know a lot of people will sit there and say well that shows that they're habituated but uh, habituation can't uh, uh can't explain it all this is a natural curiosity that they have it's it's as if they know uh or they feel that, that people are kind of a threat but not that much uh, so they approach us a lot closer than, than, they, uh, than other birds uh, do. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, last year, I was monitoring a nest in Pinnacles, and uh, the chick had just recently fledged. Uh, it was about uh, five or six, it's about six months old, and it, was, uh, it wasn't flying much. It was flying in the canyon that it was born in, and it was hopping around on these, uh, on these rocks. Uh, but I was up there just to spend the day watching it and making sure that it was okay. So I take a look and I see the bird down there below me. I'm in this really inaccessible spot. And uh, so, so I turn around and, and I start uh, going through my pack and such. And all of a sudden, two minutes later, I hear this tremendous flap of a wing. And that young bird landed on a rock about 15 feet away from me. And just stared uh, and just started looking at me, checking me out. Uh, probably one of the first human beings that I've ever seen. Uh, about 15 minutes later, uh, her mother showed up. She started uh, circling around overhead, looking at me until she finally circled lower and lower and lower and dropped on that rock right by her daughter. And they both kind of just looked at me. And then they kind of turned their attention towards each other. And they just sat there uh, for about 45 minutes. And it was one of the most incredible uh, wildlife experiences that I've ever had. And uh, these are the kind of things, this, this is, to me is what makes the California condor so special. It, it's a combination of size uh, and strikingness and uh, the attitude that it has. Uh, so, yeah. Suffice it to say, if I was hooked on condors when I was seven years old, um, I'm still hooked uh, 50 years down the line. So that's my story about condors and attitude. I guess. I've been hooked on uh, rare and endangered species since I was a kid, too. And um, for years, I've been telling people that if we pr protected enough land around Mount Diablo and made sure it stayed connected to the Diablo Range, um, that eventually California condors would come back. We had brought peregrine falcons back, golden eagles were doing pretty well, um, and, and protect enough habitat and California condors would come back. In fact, in our work uh, about the Diablo Range, I've described it as a mountain lion, golden eagle, California condor, wildlife corridor freeway. Um, and so a week or two ago, I was on, a, on vacation traveling um, through some national parks in some Northwestern states. And I got a text message from you. And tell us, tell us about uh, uh, what you found. Okay, and so why, why it's so extraordinary. Yeah, so uh, we have transmitters, we have GPS transmitters on uh, many of our condors, not all of them, but many of them. And uh, one of the things that I really like to do 
is to go into our database and check on where the birds have been moving because I'm fascinated with movement. Uh, and in the past, we've had birds fly up as far north as the outskirts of Livermore, but they never went as far as Altamont Pass and they never got into, I guess, the Tri-Valley area. They never, they never got to Mount Diablo. Uh, we had birds do that uh, maybe 10 or starting 10 or 12 years ago. And usually once or twice a year, a bird will go up to the edge of Livermore and then turn around and go back. Well, a couple of weeks ago, one of our young birds, 828, uh, flew up and beyond, went beyond Altamont Pass, uh, went to uh, Morgan Territory, Round Valley, flew around just east of Mount Diablo for about an hour or two, and then headed back down south. So uh, that, I think, constitutes, and I'm not positive about this, but uh, uh, that may be the first condor to have visited Contra Costa County since maybe uh, the 1800s. I'm just throwing that out there. And I know that Doug Bell is on the, is on the um, Zoom here with us, a, a wildlife biologist from East Bay Regional Park District, and he will know the record of when, when uh, a California condor was last seen here. But this is an extraordinary event. It should be reported in newspapers. We haven't gotten around to something like that yet, but, um, and the, the GPS track is, is confidential. Um, but this was something that some of us have been waiting our entire lives for, a California condor in Contra Costa County and on in the Mount Diablo area, just east of Mount Diablo on Morgan Territory and uh, um, uh, Round Valley. Um, so Doug, if you want to comment on that, Joanne or Karen, could one of you, uh, um, turn his mic on. I just did that. Doug, your mic is still, uh, there you go. Hello. Uh, yeah, good evening. Well, welcome, everybody. That is really spectacular news. Just absolutely, absolutely wonderful. Um, you know, Beth, uh, uh, Seth, I, I don't, I actually don't have um, that information on when the last California condor was, you know, cited in um, Contra Costa County. At least I don't have it at hand, but I will. I will look it up. I might reference uh, some of the using the vertebrate zoology records at uh, UC Berkeley. I think uh, maybe um, Joseph Grinnell um, may have may have a, a record about that. So, so I'll look into that and get back to you. But anyway, thank you so much. This is this is really great, really a, a great presentation. Really enjoying it. I might just say it'd be great someday to go into Mount Diablo into some of the cliffs. And caves and perhaps do some um, sifting of the soils and potential nest caves and see if one can't come up with some fragments of condor eggs. That would be cool. Yeah, you've just thanks. heard of a pro you've just heard of a project that Save Mount Diablo is going to be involved in sifting the sand at the bottom of wind caves looking for condor um, artifacts or, or eggshells or bones or whatever. We're coming to the end of our lecture and I wanted to give Joseph a chance to um, tell you uh, what the Diablo Range means to him and uh, just a little bit of a closing statement. Um, I don't think we're gonna have time for many questions, but we will answer your questions um, in an email that we send out to everybody. Um, so Joseph, thank you so much for coming up here and spending your time. He's in the office with us today in a separate room, but spending your time uh, coming to talk to us about your book and about the Diablo Range. Uh, we really, really appreciate you being a part of this. So. Closing statement. Well, first of all, thank you, Seth, and everybody at, at Save Mount Diablo, because uh, basically my, my closing statement is this. Uh, I love the work that you're doing and the fact that uh, you see the Diablo range in its entirety as a connected entity uh, is music to my ears. Uh, you know, I got into conservation biology because I wanted to, uh, to do some, something positive. Uh, I felt that I, maybe I could do that as a scientist, or maybe I could do it as an author. A and, uh, you know, just to, to be able to have an audience like this and to be able to inspire people to protect and preserve this range, uh, but that's just, uh, that just uh, makes my day. We, we thank you very much. Um, Karen, am I, I write that, uh, um, we don't have time for questions. 
Um, well, we're at 457. So, um, you know, it's totally up to you. I'm thinking that we could probably pull together some really nice responses to the questions, which I don't think are straightforward, simple questions in the presentation um, email that we sent to everybody after the event. So the way I will close it is I will say, um, hopefully you have been um, healed and inspired by this lecture. Um, and uh, I will always say to my dying day, as I did with people on a hike today in Pine Canyon, um, Save Mount Diablo is preserving your backyard. Um, it's preserving, preserving things that you care about. And we hope you will support us if you can afford to, to expand your support for us and to put us in your will um, so that, that uh, uh, you help us with the acquisitions that, that come along on a very regular basis. I, I was telling Joseph today that it's, it's kind of strange, but we get big bequests from time to time and they always seem to come right as we need them for some huge acquisition. Uh, a year or two ago, there was one that came on the same day that we signed the purchase papers for a large acquisition and it was exactly the amount of money we needed. So uh, um, putting us in your estate planning is really important. Um, and I, you should all go out and buy the Diablo Diary, Joseph Belli's uh, uh, book about the Diablo range. Um, and we'll let you know when his California Condor book comes out sometime in the next year. Um, and uh, uh, we'll look for you at our next Nature Heals and Inspires uh, Zoom lecture. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Oh, thank you.